It is the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the birthplace of Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, Israel is the centerpiece of God's story, a saga that continues to unfold in our daily news. But behind the headlines are the people caught in the crosshairs of some really complex issues. It can be hard to see clearly from the outside, so let's explore my homeland from within. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. It is the standard greeting in Israel. Yet for the rest of the world, this small nation is a major point of contention. In this episode, we examine the concept of peace in the Middle East. All countries in the Middle East talk about peace. You know, salam alaikum. You greet people with the peace of God upon them. Here we say shalom. Shalom, shalom, shalom when we greet somebody. Shalom when we say goodbye to somebody. You pray and hope for peace all the time. But here in this region, we have seen one of the most profound anti-peace societies, talking of the whole of the Middle East. And a lot of it is against Israel. Israel, it is not just a place of holy sites. It is a place which is one of the most intellectually articulate and active countries in the world. If there's a problem, Israel can sort it out. There is David Citadel. This is a land where things which we take for granted, like the CAT scanner, was invented here. This is a land which has one of the most developed cardiac, surgical and transplant programs in the world. If they can't do it here, they can't do it anywhere. Israel says it's the only democracy in the Middle East. It's one of the only democracies in the world. Well, considering I've got MS and I'm supposed to be terminally ill, I'm doing very well. It's not just a democracy, it's almost anarchy. Because anybody can get their foot into the Knesset. Small parties, they all have a say. Religion in the Middle East is fundamentally different to Western perception of it. Here, religion and politics can't be separated. Jerusalem, the religious capital of the world, the homeland to the three monotheistic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And yet, as you look around the Middle East, you realize that there is never really a separation between religion and politics. One of the fundamental difficulties that the Americans had when they came into Iraq, and I was there and very much involved in the process leading towards that, was they had no concept of the role of religion in Middle Eastern affairs. They kept talking about 
Oh, we believe in a separation of church and state, separation of religion and politics. Whilst in reality, religion and state are more connected in America than almost any other country. You can see how every nation needs religious leadership. In Judaism, we say we're looking for the messianic age, that one day the Mashiach will come, that he will come firstly as Mashiach ben Yosef, the servant Messiah, and then he will come as Mashiach ben David, the kingly Messiah. And so even in Judaism, you have a certain messianic hope. In Christianity, you have that same messianic hope. We call it the second coming. And in Islam, you have the hope of the coming of the 12th Imam, who is called Mahdi. So with all three communities, there is a messianic hope. Because I'm very much part of Israel and Iraq, I thought it would be great to try and get a meeting together of Iraqis and Israelis. And at first, nobody wanted to do it. They all hated each other. But eventually, we did manage to bring them together for three days. After three days, I asked them, well, what? What has happened? One of the chief rabbis said, I've been here for three days and I've got three words to say. Fear is cancelled. One of the Ayatollahs said, I came here hating you Jews. I came here, I heard your story. I looked into your eyes and you've become my friend. They're in close proximity, but they never know each other. You know, how many people from the west of Jerusalem here really know the people in Bethlehem or Ramallah? They live in closed off worlds amongst their own people. And yet, if they were to meet the other, they could love the other. I would state, first and foremost, we have got to love both Jew and Arab. So often people think, I'm on this side, or I'm on that side, and that is a, a devastating thing. We must begin to think about reaching out. Wherever we are, think, who is my supposed enemy here? Why are the Muslims seen like this? How can I reach out to them? And I say, when we meet, we must eat. There's always hospitality shown to us by the Muslim community. Whenever I go and see the Ayal Chola in Baghdad, he always cooks a whole sheep for me, which is a bit difficult when you're vegetarian and you don't eat much anyway, but there it goes. I was down by the Jordan River, where there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of mines from the 1967 war. There were seven churches in these minefields. Obviously, nobody can go to them. Peace involves putting an end to the pain of the past, the demining, but it also has to be active. We have to work towards trying to get a peaceful situation. When religion goes wrong, it goes very wrong. And religion has become a weapon and religion has become a means of hate, not of peace. 
and I have never forgotten the tragedy of the Christian attitude towards the Jewish people. And I have never stopped my fight of trying to look for a better way. Hostility, war, fraction, hatred, the opposite of peace is everything that causes division and breaks relationships. Peace is about restoration, wholeness, healing and reconciliation. Peace is going to come to the land of the Holy One? No. I think there will always be opposition. But we have got to keep working for the peace of Jerusalem. May they that love her prosper. Yes, we can clear out the minds which could kill people, but we need something to look forward to the future. The Apostle Paul said in Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. He continually encouraged believers to pursue peace and show love to their enemies. This is still the mandate of God's people today. For just as Jesus told his followers, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Gates open. Yuda, how are you? Good, good. Yeah. Long time no see. No, how was the holiday? It's going good. Yeah? Yeah. You, you oh, have wow. a nice suka? The notion of taking different societies, different mentalities and different cultures and trying to separate them with a document that's been engineered in an air-conditioned conference room somewhere else on planet Earth is not going to work here. What's going to work here is from the ground up. Anything new going on here? Heck yeah, everything is uh, doing well. We have a lot of work. The term settlement is often used as a derogatory term to describe the Israeli communities east of the Green Line in what the Israeli communities refer to themselves as Judea Samaria, the heritage names of this region. Much of the world calls it the West Bank. When looking at this region from the outside in, people tend to see things through a conflict lens. They're looking at things, they're seeing conflict, they're looking for conflict, they're even feeding the fire. We go about our daily lives, living normally, kids go to school, adults go to work. That's true both for Israelis and for Palestinians. So for us, it's not a conflict paradigm, it's a neighbor paradigm. 85% local market and around 50 to 20% uh, export. Like this. But the Palestinian Authority tried to forbid Palestinians from working in any of the industrial parks here. We have uh, around 100 employees, 40 of them Israeli, 60 of them Palestinian. We can find uh, Israel and Palestinian in a management position or a simple worker. All of them, Israel and Palestinian, it depends on the Israeli law. The, all the social condition and salary condition is dependent on the Israeli law. Then it's no different between the people who are working here. Same salary, same day. And we have a wonderful time, and uh, we send the people to, uh, this year to Aqaba for three days, a vacation. The outside observer wants to put up these artificial walls here. They want to separate populations. They want everything to kind of fit into these neat little boxes, and they suggest all kinds of solutions or political solutions to move them in that direction. They're trying to institutionalize the separation. The more that separation has taken hold, the less people have been able to have normal, organic interactions with one another. The spaces, the opportunity for overlap has been more limited. We'd like to see things moving in the other direction. This is Shimon. It's one of the oldest employees that I have in my company. And he worked hand by hand with the Palestinian and it's great for me, and it's great for them, and it's great for all of us. This guy is from uh, is Palestinian, from Kares. All of us like a big family. And I think you can get this relationship 
just in the place that we are working together. And our mission is to bring the company for the best result. And this is my target. And all of the workers doing the best to get the best result. Because they know we have a one big plate, all of us eating from this plate. And if we will success, they're getting more, i getting more, and all of us living in a wonderful time. I am because of him. All the workers working with me, the company success because of them, not because of me. Shimon is 73 years old, and I give him opportunity to continue working until he will say, Yuda, it's enough for me. But I give him a nice car, I respect him a lot, and he's doing a wonderful job for me. What can I say? People with me can work until the day that they say, enough. We're doing well, and I am happy, they are happy. And all of us, this is a hope. Right. This is a hope between Israel and Palestinians. More and more places that they can walk together, live together, and know each other, and bring the peace from the bottom. This is what we are doing. We are not politics. We are not speaking. We're just walking and doing a good connection between people. This is the hope of the Middle East. Israeli and Palestinian or Arabs and Israeli who found a place to work together, to live together, and to find a way how to live and by peace. Here we can I don't know a single person who doesn't want to live in peace, but I also know too many politicians who use peace as a tagline for all sorts of other things. They're trying to advance a particular agenda. They know their end game, and the process isn't really all that relevant to them. I want to take you to the uh, management room. When you speak about economic mutual interests or mutual investment, you speak about health interests. Everybody needs to be healthy. It doesn't matter about the governments anymore. It doesn't matter about the politicians or would-be solution makers. Um, it matters about the real people on the ground level. We just speak about uh, our life. And this is what you can see here is the days that we know how to take a day off. This is Lipsky. This is Israeli and Palestinian together who know how to enjoy it and to live together. And this is from the, you see, the just two months ago, the, I took them to Aqaba. We're trying to create a situation where at the Ariel Industrial Park, we can have not only Palestinian employees, but also Palestinian factory owners as well. We're trying to create a new entrepreneurship accelerator, which will have joint Israeli and Palestinian teams working, coming up not only with the next business solutions for the future, but the next social action programs for the future as well. Dive there, I swim. As you, you can see me here. Uh, and some of them are dived. And uh, look at us. I think this is, uh, first of all, Aqaba is a beautiful place. And second, the people going because of the company to enjoy with their women and uh, all of us doing the best to live well and uh, all of that we can get just because we have industrial area or Palestinian or Israeli working together. And we should increase this idea and maybe, as I said, the peace will come from the people and not from the leaders because the leaders don't want to do peace. I can't tell you what the magic solution is because I don't believe there's a magic solution. I believe that anyone who tells you that they know exactly what needs to be done doesn't know what needs to be done. We just know that it has to happen organically to the real human beings living here. Peace is inevitable. Peace is going to unfold, but it's going to happen not through a political process, but from a human process. Psalm 2911 says, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Peace is more than just the external result of unity. Peace, shalom, is the internal strength that continues to carry God's people through seasons of persecution, conflict, and danger, freeing the prisoners of fear and breaking the cycle of hate. I started as an assistant pastor in Gaza, in Gaza Baptist Church. about one million and a half people living in Gaza. 
Among all of them, 3,000 Christians living as a minority in Gaza. There is a kind of peace between Palestinian Muslim and Palestinian Christian. But when radical Islam came and uh, people become more close mind, they thought that this is our right, so you don't have right. They start to be more extreme, thinking that this is what their God want them to be, not in living uh, in peace with Christian, but make a pressure over the Christian, like you should believe in Islam. They speak to you about Islam and you don't able to say, I don't want to hear. It wasn't before like this. It wasn't before like this. I love Gaza a lot. I was uh, praying for Gaza a lot. I was interceding for Gaza a lot. I was praying for his people a lot. I was convincing people to stay in Gaza rather than to go out of Gaza. Even I will go, I thought I will go and return back. If you live in Gaza, you live in kind of phobia. When you feel you are a minority, you could give up to ask for your rights you try to compromise with everything, with your faith even, in order to live in the area. And this will make you a slave mentality, like it will let you uh, feel like you are down and you are nothing. I was making disciples for couples in the church and uh, one of them, uh, his name is Rami. I start to see him more frightened. He was in uh, in his office as a in Bible society in Gaza, uh, and uh, somebody told him, "Do you believe in a prophet Muhammad?" He said, uh, "I don't uh, believe actually. This is not written in my book." And uh, then he said, "I will show you how to believe." Like he threatened Rami. He was walking with his wife and felt like somebody following him. So he was frightened when he came in the group. Next day, he was kidnapped. When he was kidnapped, he called us so that he will come back. And he called his wife, he told her the same. At 3 a.m., he was killed. I went to the hospital quickly and go to the morgue. I was the first one that get in. I was walking in the blood and I was like looking and I, I saw him and he was the first martyr actually in Gaza for Christian. How much I live in this area, how much I serve this area, how much I loved those people, how much I prayed for the people, uh, uh, like something broke in my heart because of this situation. I'm tempted to be a pressure ever against Muslim, against Jewish, against people, um, against everyone. Conditionally, they are not worth to be loved. Like, they are not worth to be a greeting. If your heart not pure, you will not be able to live freely with God. I will still think about them. I will be a prisoner under thinking victim mentality. He still loved them. How I could hate them. Why I just take one step, one, one thing and say like, Lord, why? Because I don't see, I saw a piece of puzzle. I don't see all the puzzle. I don't see all the picture. I should go step in trusting him and trust his love. His love not according to situation. Is not love not according to the pressure around me? The Lord was doing process with me. Even the hard people, He loved them. He's not happy of killing them. He loved to retain them back. This changed my my heart to to Muslim actually. He said, "Do you think that I am happy that if they perish, like or they killed? I'm more happy if they return back to me." and now establishing new ministry in Bethlehem. Uh, Beit Sahur, it's part of Bethlehem.
Beit Sahur means light to come. They start to think of people by grace. I start to think about Muslim by grace, think about Jewish by grace. I start to search to see them by the heart of the Father, that He loved them and He wanted them to be in His community, in His kingdom. My family name is Khuri, means a priest. From my family line came about 34 Orthodox priests. Maybe I break the line, but it's the first pastor in this family, but I believe the Lord blessed the inheritance of faith. The Lord, he said, my peace I gave is different than the peace of the world. And his peace coming through trusting him, how much we love him, we trust him, how much peace come in. Our world is full of conflict. We have warring nations, ideologies, governments, and people groups. Most days, peace seems out of our reach, especially here in the Middle East. But in reality, this land is the birthplace of peace. When Jesus was born, the heavens invaded the earth with a resounding sound of shalom. Peace on earth, the angels declared the night Christ was born. The Bible calls him the Prince of Peace. And according to the prophet Isaiah, the government rests on his shoulder. This is still true today. Jesus Christ came into our troubled world and he overcame it so that shalom might echo in our hearts here on earth and for all eternity. I leave you with a psalm penned by King David, a blessing over the city and indeed a prayer for Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good.